Good morning. It's good to see everybody out this morning. I apologize. I may be a drinking preacher this morning. Uh, throat's a little dry. Trying to fight off <clears throat> what felt like it was going to be a sore throat and it couldn't quite make up his mind. It's better this morning, but earlier I started coughing, so try to prevent that if we can. Appreciate everybody's prayers while I was gone, but went to Ukraine and back western Ukraine, far away from where the fighting is. Uh, 24, 36 hours approximately. Mr. Putin said that he could be in Kiev in two weeks if he put his mind to it, so it would probably take him two or three more days after that to get to where I was. So I had plenty of advance notice if he had done that. Could have gone to Poland if I had to to come home. But keep the brethren there in your prayers. Um, they're a little, I don't know if traumatized is the right word, probably, maybe a little bit in shock. Um, they're having school, they're studying, they're trying to continue to do the Lord's work, but they're just a little bit out of sorts, I guess. And I'm sure all of us would be the same way if we had things happening around us that happened to them and had to move far, far away and move to a part of our country where they didn't really speak our language. And I guess we don't really have to worry about that here, but they do. They speak Russian. They're from eastern Ukraine, where the predominant language is Russian. They're now in the west, where Everybody speaks Ukrainian. So I guess maybe if we lived in Canada, it would be like trying to go to Quebec where they speak French. It uh, would be a challenge for us. I remember watching my father try to order eggs one morning for breakfast in Quebec when we were on vacation, and it just didn't work real well for some reason. So they've got those kind of challenges and probably just a little bit of doubt about where is God in all of this. Uh, so keep them in your prayers. They, they need it. They're doing a good work. They have uh, three new students and five existing students and are in a temporary location for one year and trying to determine where exactly the Lord wants them to be for the long distance of the future. So keep them in your prayers. From our scripture reading, the invisible attributes or invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Who is God? What is he like? Where did he come from? Interesting questions. Sigmund Freud, you know, the famous father of psychology, said that God was a creation or an invention by man because in ancient days, when man was living so primitively, he needed a father figure for protection, and so he was created by some very... I guess, wise people, intelligent people, to try and help comfort the masses that there was someone watching over us and caring for us. Interesting concept. Naive, but interesting. Freud had a few other ideas that if we began to examine them in light of today's knowledge, I think would turn out to be pretty seriously flawed. But that was his theory. Someone else has suggested what really happened is people came up with the concept of God because they wanted to control other people. God's watching. You can't do that. That sort of idea. And I'm sure that human beings would probably do something like that if they could. But both of these suggest that the idea of God then is just a man-made creation. Let me suggest to you that that's not the real issue here. The real issue is who's in control, ultimately. In the reading that we just had for us, it tells us that some people willfully ignored or changed their view of God, their understanding of God. And today there are some people who choose not to accept God because it's just not an acceptable option to them. One famous evolutionist is on record as saying that we know that, for example, spontaneous generation, that idea that something just suddenly comes to life that wasn't living, we know that doesn't happen. The law of biogenesis says it cannot happen. There's no known case of it ever having happened. However, we know that it happened once. And how do we know that? Because we're here. Now let that sink in just a minute, that kind of reasoning. 
And then look again at what the Apostle Paul said here in verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead or divine nature, so that they are without excuse. Is there a God? Or is this world just a happy accident in the words of one individual? Now, when we're talking about God at this point, we're not talking about the God of the Bible necessarily. We'll talk about that in a future lesson. But does God exist? Is there some kind of a being out there that was capable of creating this world and did so? Or is this world just here by complete accident? Paul says there's plenty of evidence. The scientists today tell us, no, nah, there's no evidence. Who's right? I want to suggest to you Paul is right. One thing scientists have determined is this world is not going to last forever. There's something called the second law of thermodynamics. I would love to explain it to you, but I don't fully comprehend it. But it basically says this. There's nothing new being created. Things are just being used up. And eventually, it's all going to be used up and it's going to be gone and there won't be any more energy, if I understand that correctly. I kind of like this illustration. A scientist tried to make it to where people like me could understand it. He said it's kind of like, you remember those old alarm clocks you used to get a big bend and you'd wind it up in the morning and it'd go tick tock, tick tock all night long. And well, he said this world is like somebody took an alarm clock and wound it up and now it's very slowly unwinding. And eventually it's going to get to the point where all that winding up is gone and there won't be anything left to wind up. Hmm. That means if somebody or something wound it up, it had a beginning point. You remember with those old alarm clocks, you would get it and you'd set the time and you'd wind it up. And eventually you figured out that, well, okay, every day or every two days or every 36 hours or every 27 hours, I have to rewind this clock or it's not going to work. You remember that? Were you one of those folks that used to forget to wind it up one day so you could sleep in and not go to school the next morning? I'm sure none of you would have ever thought of that. I, we won't talk about me. But somebody has to wind it up. Who wound this up? Didn't just happen, did it? Kind of makes sense to me when somebody said, out of nothing comes nothing. So where did this something that's all around us come from? God. Now, let's think about some of the evidence. Any of you would like to watch the program Mountain Men? I see some of you smiling and nodding. You know, there's these fellows that, you know, I think of Mountain Men, I thought they were supposed to ride around on a horse in a fur coat and live in a den or something out there. They've got some pretty nice homes in this particular program, but that's, I guess that means they're successful. There's one fellow who, his primary job is to watch for, uh, yeah, cougars, large cats, you know, lions, mountain lions that eat people when they can find them. He tries to find them and drive them away far away from where the people are because they eat the cattle and they eat the pets and they, in one case, were wandering around a school. And they never saw this animal, but they knew it was there because they saw those footprints in the snow. Evidence. So we're talking about evidence for God in the world around us. When things happen by accident, how do they normally work? Does everything kind of work together and after the accident occurs, it's just this nice uh, uh, 
fixed system where everything fits together and does exactly what it's supposed to do. You ever experienced that? You ever had an automobile accident? And everything turned out fine, right? And as a matter of fact, it worked better afterwards? Never heard of that happening. But when you look at the world around us, how much of the world works together and complements one another? Yellowstone National Park, a few years ago, I watched a special. Some of the trees were beginning to die. And they could not determine what the problem was. It didn't seem to be environmental. They didn't have a big pollution issue. And then so somebody went and did a study, and they determined what was happening is the deer were eating too many of the small saplings as they were growing up. And then they got to thinking about this. Well, why hasn't this happened before in, in the past of Yellowstone? And they got to studying and researching, and they realized there's no wolves to keep the deer moving, and so they have time to stop and just eat all these young trees. And they reintroduced wolves, and guess what happened? All of a sudden, the trees started growing again. Now, if you'd asked me if a wolf was a good thing, I'd have said no way, because I remember all those fairy tales on how bad wolves are, right? Like Robin Hood. I'm not Robin Hood, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a hood in there somewhere, but I'm Little Red Riding Hood, I'll get it. Jet lag is a wonderful thing. You know, so I, I just assume wolves are bad, but they're not. They're part of this balance God has created in nature. And when man starts messing with it, we always mess it up. They got rid of the wolves, and all of a sudden there's a problem with the trees growing. And maybe you've heard about somebody decided to battle insects in Australia, so they brought in this toad, and it has no natural predator. Now it's taking over the countryside. There was an island out in the Pacific where they decided there were too many snakes, so they brought in some mongooses. They got rid of the snakes, and now it's overrun with rats. But when we let nature do the way, it thinks, the way God designed it to be done, it works. That's not an accident. That's not evidence of something that just happened without any forethought or planning. God made this world to exist the way it exists. There's countless examples. Have you ever studied those little fish that climb up into the mouths of sharks and clean them out? Clean, and then the sharks never eat them? But anything else gets close, what happens to it with the shark? It eats it, or at least tries to. Countless examples. You can probably sit here and think of all kinds of examples of that kind of thing. This world is not an accident. It was planned, it was purposed, it shows every evidence of that. Just consider your body. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. How many miles of circulatory system? The writer of Leviticus, Moses, said that the life is in the blood. How long has it been that we truly understood that, story, that uh, statement? George Washington, you remember, our first president, famous American, so important we put him on the $1 bill so that everybody could see his face a lot, I guess, got sick. You know how they tried to the heal him. One solution was they had to bleed him, get the bad blood out. And my understanding is doctors didn't, you know, want you to get lopsided because you got too much blood on one side out, so they'd bleed the other side as well. Not understanding that that blood is important, apparently. Yet Moses said long, long ago that the life is in the blood. A man named Michael Denton, I can remember that one pretty easy, wrote a book, and in the last chapter, he describes what takes place in a single cell in our bodies. It's fascinating. 
and he wrote it so the people who aren't scientists could understand it. He basically says each single cell is a manufacturing plant that brings in raw materials, makes a production of a product, and has a waste disposal system, and it all works in coordination with all the other cells in the body. And we're supposed to believe that that's just an accident. It's not. There is a God who created this world, a being. Now the question is, is it the God that we read about in the Bible or not? There are other gods that are being worshipped. In the Far East, or in the, I'm sorry, in the Middle East, you have Muhammad. Tells us that it's Allah. And if you go to places like India, you'll be told that, no, it's Krishna. And the thousands of other manifestations of God. And of course, our Bible tells us it's the one God of the scriptures, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So which one is correct? To my knowledge, the only one that presents evidence for who he is, is the one in the Bible. That he is that creator God. For example, turn back in the book of Exodus, to Exodus chapter 5. This is after God has appeared to Moses in the wilderness down there at that burning bush and says, I want you to go back to Egypt and preach to Pharaoh and deliver my people. And Moses, of course, said, no, no, I'm not the man for the job. And he has that long discussion with God. Finally, God convinces him, and he goes. And Aaron is with him. And they go into Pharaoh. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Pharaoh asked an interesting question. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I don't know this God. Why should I listen to him? The Egyptians had hundreds of gods. That's who Pharaoh listened to. Moses said, no, you better listen to the Lord. The rest of the story is this. God told Moses that he's going to go out and perform ten plagues on Egypt. Or that's what ended up happening. Ten plagues. So that Pharaoh could have the answer to his question, who is God? Every plague was designed to expose one or more Egyptian gods of having no power. The God of heaven not only gave us all this evidence if we'll just look at it and reason about it, but then he also says, I'm going to act in ways to indicate who I am. And so, ten plagues against the, ten, the gods of Egypt. Then if you go over to 1 Kings... In the days of King Ahaz, they had a confrontation up on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. In verse 21, see they had this problem in ancient Israel. Is it Baal or is it God? Or are they one and the same? Some some indications of the scriptures are they thought God and Baal were the same. They could worship Baal and be worshiping God. They could worship God and be worshiping Baal. It didn't matter, as long as you went to worship one of them. Notice the words in 1 Kings 18, verse 21. So Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. And the people didn't say anything. They just kind of sat there. And so Elijah proposed a contest. You remember the story? They were to construct altars, lay out the sacrifice, but let the God who is God answer with fire. 
The prophets of Baal constructed theirs, laid out the sacrifice, and started calling on God. They cut themselves. They cried out. They did all sorts of things to try and get his attention. No answer from Baal. <coughs> then finally, Elijah reconstructed an old altar for God, laid the wood, laid the sacrifice, and then poured water over the sacrifice. And the sacrifice was consumed from the top down. It consumed the sacrifice first, then the wood, and then went around the fire, burning up all of the water around. I'm going to challenge you to do something this afternoon if you have the time. If not tonight, then later. Get out of concordance. Look up the word, at least in the New King James and the King James, it's the word no. And go through the Bible and notice every occasion where God said something is going to happen so that people would know who he is. No. He acts. And he says he's going to act and then he does it. And he's recorded it for us so that it can be confirmed. If you'd like to do some interesting reading... Read some of the holy writings of some of the other so-called gods and see what you find. You won't find them saying that certain people came to a certain place and God acted in a certain way. This doesn't happen. You read the scriptures and you find out that God took his people and went to this place, that place, another place. He tells you what happened. Archaeologists have been going over there for centuries now digging up around Palestine and other parts of the east over there around Palestine and finding evidence. Matter of fact, there was a group of people at one time known as biblical minimalists. They said, unless we can find archaeological evidence for these things, we won't accept them as true. They said for a long time, King David, there's no evidence King David really existed. Well, guess what they found? Evidence for King David. They found so much evidence that finally somebody wrote in Biblical Archaeology Review, I believe it was, a year or two years ago, and finally said, there's so much evidence we can give. It. Biblical minimalism is dead. The Bible's got it right. There's just way too much evidence that we've already found. God is the only one. The Bible's the only holy writings that gives us that kind of information that can be fact-checked. I think there's a reason for that. It's because this book is real, God is real. And he's the God who acts in people's lives. I don't always understand how, don't always understand why. We'll talk about some of those things in a later lesson. But we serve a God today that we don't have to wonder if he exists. We don't have to think that, well, you know, there's it's a lot of evidence. Uh, so probably, no. We can know he exists. And we can know who Jesus is. And we can know the scriptures are his divinely inspired revelation of himself to us. You see, it took a revelation for us to know. We can look at the evidence and understand there's a creator out there, the being powerful enough to create this world. But it doesn't tell us much about him. It doesn't tell us how to know him. But he wants us to know him. He wants a relationship with us. And he wants us with him for all eternity in heaven. He wants that so badly, he sent his son into this world to live as a human being, to die as a human being and then raised him from the dead so that we can know. And then he has told us exactly what we need to do in order to obtain the forgiveness of sin, our violation of his will. And so we can have that opportunity to spend eternity with him. Some things I don't fully understand. I can't comprehend eternity. You know, in my mind, everything has a beginning and an end. Eternity has no beginning and it has no end.
but I have enough evidence from everything he's told us that I believe it's true. I just don't fully understand it. There is a God in heaven. He is the God that revealed himself in the pages of the scriptures. He is the God who loved you enough to send his son to die for you. The question remains, do you love him enough to leave this assembly this morning and live for him, getting to know him better each and every day of your life through your study of the scriptures, through your dedication and devotion to him and service to him and your fellow human beings? His conditions are very simple in order to achieve the benefit of his son's uh, gift of salvation. First, you have to believe that he is. Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You must believe that. That is, it has to be up here. You have to believe it with your mind. You need to repent of your sins. Jules has talked about that word repent. It means to turn away from. You have to give up the Frank Sinatra way, which is my way. Isn't he the one that sang my way? I did it my way. Can't do it that way anymore. Now you do it God's way. Turn away from that. Go to God. That's repentance. Acts 17, 30, and 31, he's given us assurance of the need for that in raising Jesus from the dead. You need to confess him as your Lord. You need to be convinced enough and convicted enough that you tell people out there in the world that he's your Lord. They'll make fun of you. They'll mock you. They'll ridicule you. They did it to him. That we should expect it to us. But you need to be willing to confess him throughout your life. And then you need to be buried with him by baptism. You need to be immersed in water on his authority to receive the remission of your sins. That's Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 22.16. Ananias made it so clear. He walked into Saul, that room where Saul of Tarsus was, on that street called Straight in the city of Damascus, and said, Saul... Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But just so that we get the full picture, in Romans 6, 17, Paul told the Romans that they had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered them. That form was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. You die in repentance. You're buried with him by baptism, Paul said in Romans 6, 3, and 4. And verse 4, raised to walk in newness of life, or as one translation puts it, a new way of living. If that's not you this morning, that's where it all begins. That's how you begin this relationship with the God of the scriptures, the God who created this world, the God who has a place prepared for you in heaven for all eternity. Lord willing, in the future, we'll talk some more about God, try to better understand him. But he's the creator, therefore he's the owner. He has the right to set the rules. But he loved us enough that he doesn't just punish us for violating the rules. He said, here's a way that I'll forgive it all. Have you accepted that offer? If not, we have a baptistry, and we'll gladly take your confession of Jesus based on your belief and repentance and immerse you for the remission of your sins. We'll baptize you. You can do the same thing Saul of Tarsus did. You can arise and be baptized this very hour. Maybe you're a child of God, and somewhere along the line, you've, well, you've just not been walking in the light, First John 1, 7. You're here, and that's good, but maybe when you go out there, Pressures of the world are causing you to not live quite like you're supposed to. Maybe you need the prayers of the church on your behalf for that. We'll gladly pray with you and for you. James says that we need to confess our faults to one another and pray for one another. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 
Are you a child of God in need of prayers? Do you need to confess some sin? Ask the church to pray with you, for you? Do you need to respond to the Lord's initial invitation and wash away your sins in baptism? Only you can answer those questions. But if the answer is yes, and we can assist you, we'd invite you to come as we stand and sing. Lions call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. While we tarry below, there is work to do. And our strength cometh from above. As we labor and wait, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne.